Brilliant, thank you. So we're going to spend a few weeks now through August looking at the early part of Moses' story. It's a bit of a jump from two Thessalonians and looking at Paul's teaching, but I think it's really important that we go back and look at some of the Old Testament because we don't spend enough time there. We focus all the time on the Gospels or the New Testament, and actually it's a good point to start exploring one of the major characters in the overarching meta-narrative of the whole of Scripture. Now, I imagine, though, we're all sat here going, well, we know about Moses. We know he received the Ten Commandments. We know he led the, people, the Israelites out of Egypt. We know he encountered God at the burning bush. Spoiler alert for next week. We know, who he, we know that he was put in the basket and sailed down the river, and he was caught. He was found by Pharaoh's daughter. We know all of that. But what I want to do over the next few weeks is scratch below the surface and see what more is taking place below that familiar, well-known story and person of Moses. Because when we look at the early part of his life, we can see that there is much more that meets the eye. We can see that there is a lot more about what God is doing than perhaps we would first see. It reminds us that God acts in ways that we would not expect. And I think there's a few things that we can learn for the state that we find ourselves in today as a nation, as a church, and as the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I I hope you do, that when you come to church, you expect God to show up. I hope that when you get up on a Sunday morning, you think, yes, I'm going to church. I'm going to encounter the living God. You've heard a few stories from New Wine. There's a couple more to come. And we expect when we go to something like that, that God would show up and act. We expect that when we go to Latin Hall, when we went this year, that God would show up and act, and he did. But what about the times when God shows up and speaks to us when we least expect it. It's not just in the Christian gatherings that God shows up. Shock horror. Actually, God shows up in the everyday, in the unexpected, through the unexpected conversation, through the unexpected encounter with the person in the street. What about those times, though? How are they used to prepare us for what is to come? Well, a lot of this can be found from the reading today. And for the the first part of this talk, I'm focusing on the first 10 verses. Because what we find today is a boy is born who will free the Israelites from slavery and who will become a mighty man of God. Yet, in his infancy, he's placed in a basket and ends up with Pharaoh, the one who ultimately he will convince to let God's people go. Does that sound familiar? Because actually there's similarities to another boy who is born quite a bit later in a manger in Bethlehem who had to flee to Egypt, who was the son of God, who would free us all from the tyranny of sin by dying for us. There are the similarities. But it's helpful if we read the birth of Moses in the context of chapter 1 and where we find ourselves. The Israelites are slaves in Egypt. And it is through this particular birth of Moses that we start to see a long-running theme of deliverance throughout Scripture. It begins here and it follows through and it will be revisited time and time again. We will talk about a new creation time and again. And Moses' birth is one example of a common theme that runs throughout the Old Testament. Often at those critical points in the life of Israel, the birth of a child is instrumental to God's plan. The people are in a dire situation, and God will deliver his people by a child being born. Moses' birth, he will deliver the Israelites from Egypt. Samuel, who will anoint David. The judges is littered with people that God raises up in the times of absolute crisis. Moses' birth is in many ways against the odds. He was expected to be killed. Yet his mother puts him in a basket and sends him down the Nile. 
What about throughout the Old Testament where we see so many children born to women who are childless? Abraham and Sarah. Obviously, Abraham's not a woman. Sarah. But we see it throughout the Old Testament when people are struggling to conceive. God then does something and that child becomes something incredible for God. This child, Moses, is special. We don't know much about his upbringing until we hear in verse 11 that one day he went out to see his people and he kills the Egyptians, so he has to flee. Again, friends, there are themes that run throughout the Old Testament about major players in Scripture having to flee for various reasons. Once again, a pattern is starting to emerge about how God is going to use people who perhaps we wouldn't expect him to use. He doesn't use the people who have it all sorted. He uses the broken. He uses Moses, a murderer. He uses Noah, the drunk. He uses so many people who perhaps you wouldn't expect God to use. And that should give us hope. That whoever we are, whatever we have done, wherever we are broken, let's face it, we're all broken. God can and will use us. Because throughout Scripture, it's littered with all those people who God is going to use. He doesn't say, right, you have it all together. I'm going to use you to bring my kingdom in. Because that's not going to do any good. As John Wimber said, never trust a leader without a limp. There is nobody who can stand and say they have it all sorted. And that means that God can and will use us. You could say Moses' birth was unexpected. But I wonder, three months later, what his parents must have felt like when they got that basket, they put the baby in, and they let it float down the Nile. And how ironic that the plan to rescue him from Pharaoh ends up with him being brought up in Pharaoh's own house. That's unexpected. Pharaoh brings death, but then life. And what we see here, as elsewhere in Scripture, is the Lord showing his strength by meeting the people in the depths of their despair and working out those circumstances for the good. Pharaoh wants to counter God's plan by casting infants into the Nile. Yet, God saves Moses by casting him onto the Nile and straight into the house of Pharaoh. We see the power of God at work. Perhaps if we were to go back to Genesis for a moment, there's similarities to Joseph's story. Joseph becomes a slave in Egypt, then becomes a prisoner, But this story is another way of God providing for his people. Because we know then through the interpretation of dreams, Joseph rises through the ranks and then feeds Israel because he knows about the the famine that's coming. I know they said the strike. He knows about the famine that's coming. God was at work last week at New Wine. I came away feeling hopeful for the Church of England. And believe me, over the past few years, I have not had that feeling. I've lamented the state we've got ourselves into. I've lamented the fact that we are deviating from Scripture. But yet I came away hopeful for the future. One morning, there was a call for church leaders to go forward. And as Amanda and I went forward, I heard an audible voice from the Lord say, Behold, I am doing something new. Stand firm. Stand firm. The church looks in an utter mess at the moment. Many are crying out for God to act and to sort us all out. What if, though, the very mess that we find ourselves in at the moment is how God is going to sort his church out? It may be that we've got ourselves into such a mess that actually God is going to use that to bring about renewal and revival to bring about what we need, what the church should be. Indeed, even one of the senior clergy in this diocese admitted to me on Thursday that he agrees theologically with the Alliance, the organization that's contending for orthodoxy in the Church of England. It was quite something. I think my jaw hit the ground. 
But I was and in a conversation I was having earlier this week about the Alliance, again, which I'm signed up to. It's, they were saying, is that the right way to go about responding to the current debate? They don't agree with the line they were taking, setting up a parallel province. But I wonder if through the very nature of what they are saying is how God is going to act and how God is going to bring about revival in his church. Because we cannot continue in the way that we are. The bishops are saying we need to be united. There's a call for Christian unity. But friends, I think that is impossible with the position we have ourselves in. We strip away the subject matter. What it ultimately comes down to this debate is our biblical interpretation. And are we going to stand firm on Scripture? Take away the the subject matter. I'm not talking about that. But I wonder if by contending for, for orthodoxy, that is how God is going to renew his church, in the unexpected. It feels like the orthodox in the Church of England are down and out. But perhaps we're not. Perhaps we've got to this state so that we can then be built up into something new. There are lots of stories about death and rebirth in Scripture. And perhaps we are now in one of those moments in the church that the church is going to die to be reborn. As Isaiah tells us, we know the passage well, Isaiah 55, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We have to trust God with what he is doing. Perhaps then, the unexpected help for us is going to come from the different places that we would have expected. Perhaps God is going to surprise us by how he works. One example of this is another story that we heard, I think it was from Bishop Ruth, when she said there was a church and there was youths gathering in the porch and there was an 80-year-old woman who used to come through and just tut and get really cross for the fact these youths were hanging out in the porch of the church. I know what it's like, my curiosity, we had people hanging out in the porch and you think, what are you doing? But then the Lord spoke to her, and he said to her, why don't you just talk to them? Don't ignore them, talk to them. She spoke to them, and I think they started to see some of Jesus in her. So she was changed by that unexpected encounter, and they were changed by the unexpected encounter. So where in our lives are we looking for those unexpected encounters that will change both us and the other people? God will work through our fears and anger to bring about something good. After all, we know that walking the Christian life is not a ticket to immunity from daily trials and challenges. The mark of the Christian life is not about what happens to us, but it's on the inner strength that we have because we are called by God to participate in his kingdom. The mark of the Christian life is how our inner strength We use that to determine how we are going to live through our circumstances that are coming our way by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. We know it's not all going to be plain sailing. I know that there are lots of difficult things that each of us are facing in this congregation. And it's not to say that's not going to happen, but actually, how is God going to use those circumstances that you find yourselves in to bring about something good for the kingdom? And that's not to try and make light of all the things that we're struggling with. Because with Moses, the Lord did not react to Pharaoh's decree of let's cast the firstborns into the Nile with what do I do now? It was precisely by those means that God brings deliverance to his people. So we see through the birth of Moses that God is in control. Moses is not removed from the situation Neither is Pharaoh struck down. But God places Moses in the very place that Pharaoh meant to bring him harm. He put him right in Pharaoh's house with the person who had made this decree, and yet Moses is then growing up in that very house. In many ways, that is showing us how God is defeating the enemy decisively at his own game. The very heart of this is that Moses will eventually convince Pharaoh to let the people go. In many ways, you could say that by Moses growing up in Pharaoh's house, he would then have a better and greater understanding of the Egyptian way than somebody else. 
He's lived it for years. He's seen it for years. He has the Egyptian vantage point. As we see in Exodus 2, 11 and 12, he went out and looked at his people. So perhaps when we get to a point in the world where we're saying we don't want secularism, we want to convert all of our friends and neighbors, all of our colleagues, it's actually through those very relationships with those that don't come to church that we will find ourselves changed. It may be that actually those people who we encounter, it's not about saying, well, come give your life to Jesus now. It's about just the very way that we are acting, that they will start to see Jesus through us and in time come to make that decision themselves. Because if we are not careful, we can find ourselves in a Christian bubble because we think, actually, we don't want to talk to those people out there. We just want to talk to people that think like us and walk like us and know Jesus. But if we do that, we are failing Because Jesus tells us, go and make disciples. The Great Commission. A line from Will van der Hart, who I absolutely loved. He said, why do churches spend so much time messing about with vision statements and mission action plans? The mission action plan is right there. Go and make disciples. It's easy. So PCC, all the work that we're doing on the vision and mission plan, we're going to bin. We're not really. (laughs) I jest. Sort of. Sort of. But actually, what we need to do is we need to become charged up and ready for all that the world is going to throw at us. Because it's through how we respond to the situations we find ourselves in that people will come to see Jesus in us. In the very way that Moses went and lived in Pharaoh's house, he was able to then deliver the, deliver the Lord's people. In Habakkuk 1.5, the Lord says, I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe. In essence, God is saying that help is on the way. But again, it's going to come from an unlikely source. God can work through anyone he pleases. We see this with Cyrus, the Persian king, who defeats the Babylonians. We see that God is Lord over all creation, so he can and will use anyone to work his purposes out. But too often in the church, we discount those people who don't know Jesus. As I was preparing for this talk, and I was reading some commentaries, there was a line that really struck me. And it says this, God will direct the national superpowers of the day to serve his purpose. Now that really struck me. Reading that at a time when the Russia-Ukraine war continues, when Israel and Gaza are still at war, when there are tensions heightening within the world and we wonder whether World War III is going to come, it makes for very sobering reading. And that was penned in 2000. But in our reading today, it's not necessarily the national superpowers that are at play. What we actually see is it's more about the compassion that Pharaoh's daughter has on Moses. Exodus does not provide us with the details of Moses' relationship to Pharaoh's daughter, but it's likely that he would have come to rely on her, look up to her, and depend on her. So what we see is that it's clear that God has chosen that way to redeem his people. He is working through a non-Israelite, an Egyptian, an enemy. But it is a purposeful act of God. So what about ourselves then in 2024? What if we were to look at the world with a different lens? Perhaps we might be surprised by what we see. We share the love of Jesus with those around us. Perhaps it's through that process that the Lord will use our neighbors, co-workers, relatives to change us. Indeed, I was sent a prophecy recently from April that prophesied about that assassination attempt on Donald Trump. And it followed on by saying that he became a born-again Christian and used that his influence for an evangelistic opportunity. That, friends, is challenging. I found it really hard to hear because I can't stand the man. But... It got me thinking, what if God is going to use him to bring about something different? That would be unexpected. But what if it could happen? God could use even Donald Trump, I believe, to bring about change and renewal. After all, we never understand God's way of doing things. It's his plan and we have to trust. But perhaps we need to start thinking in a different way.
perhaps we need to start thinking how God might be thinking, looking for the unexpected, engaging with those perhaps we wouldn't necessarily engage with, and looking for God in those places where we don't expect to find him, because I think we will be surprised. Very briefly, moving on to the last few verses, what we see then is the narrative moved quickly on to Moses as a man, and then it's ending up essentially in exile. So he's gone from the privileged status in Pharaoh's house to fugitive because he murders the Egyptian to exile. And what we can read into that text, given what we know about Egyptian culture of the time, is that Pharaoh will likely know that Moses was an Israelite because Pharaoh orders Moses to be, to be killed. Chances are that if he knew he was an Egyptian prince, he could get away with what he did. That is conjecture, but at least, you know, it does make for some interesting thought. So if, and if we were to go and look at the original Hebrew in verse 11, where Moses goes out to his people, that will become a refrain in the Hebrew throughout Exodus and the other books of the Old Testament to show how God is delivering the Israelites. Moses takes the first step by going out of Egypt himself. He goes to Midian. And what we start to see now is that Moses is no longer thinking like an Egyptian in, in Pharaoh's house, but he's starting to associate himself and identify with the suffering of the Israelites. He is no longer a bystander observing what's going on from that privileged position. He is now experiencing what his very own people are going through firsthand. They have been slaves in Egypt. Moses is now in exile in Midian. He has to leave before he can come back to bring deliverance. And we start to see Moses' heart and his compassion and his humility. It's by fleeing to Midian that his spiritual journey to becoming Israel's deliverer begins. We know that it will come to a climax on Mount Horeb, which we will explore next week with the burning bush. And Yahweh announcing he would use Moses for a mighty purpose. So friends, if you feel that you've been in exile, God will be using that to bring about change for you. To bring about change for those that you know. Moses had to flee before he could deliver. David has to flee. It's in the Bible. People flee. Even Jesus, he doesn't necessarily flee, but he goes into the wilderness. So when we find ourselves feeling like we're in exile, it's because God is preparing us for something new. But that is a real challenge to us in this day and age. So perhaps we need that shift in our mindset that no matter how bad things will get, the Lord will bring deliverance to his people. It will probably mean we are shifted from comfortable positions to difficult ones. As Moses went from Pharaoh's house to Midian, perhaps we are going to go from the comfort of the church to something much more uncomfortable. But I do believe that that is how God is building our character to use us for what is to come, whatever that may be. So this morning... Let's think about how God might surprise us. Let's think about what unexpected circumstances he might use. And I realize that's hard because it's unexpected. But how is God going to bring about change for the kingdom? Perhaps what we need to do as a first port of call is to humble ourselves before him and say, here we are, Lord. Use us. After all, Jesus humbled himself to become a servant and went to the cross. So how are we going to humble ourselves this morning to be used by the Lord for good as Moses was from his privileged position into exile? Amen.